My name is Susan O'Sullivan, and I'm the Chief External Relations Officer at Fiboli. I'm so pleased to invite you all to the third installment of our Women's Speaker Series. And today we're so happy to um, have Stephanie Linder from the San Francisco Botanical Garden join us in a conversation with our CEO, Kara Newport. Um, we would love for you all to participate in the conversation today. And so please use the Q&A feature, which uh, you, can, you can see either at the top of your screen, oops, you can see either at the top of your screen or at the bottom. Um, you can put questions in here and either Kara will field them during their talk or we'll get to them at the end of the talk. So feel free to ask your questions throughout the uh, conversation and um, we would love to hear from you. And next week is the final installment of our Women's Speaker Series, where we'll be in conversation with the women of Filoli and our horticulture department um, and hearing their stories of their career paths and why they've chosen horticulture and how they've landed at Filoli. Um, so I hope that you'll join us next week, too. We have room um, in the webinar for next week, and you can reserve your tickets on our website at filoli.org slash women dash speakers. And I wanna make sure you all know here at, at, as well, I'm sure at the San Francisco Botanical Garden, spring has sprung and uh, we are open every day from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. The daffodils are just passing their peak, but the daffodil field is still spectacular. The tulips are just coming into their peak and looking amazing, especially in this area of the garden here in the bell beds. Um, magnolias are still blooming voraciously in front of the house. And we're just awaiting the cherry blossoms and the mag and the wisteria anytime soon. So we're at peak, peak, spring bloom. It's all happening. And we would love for you to join us. I want to just make sure everyone knows that because of the COVID guidelines, we're operating with a restricted or a reduced admission. So um, we're not having um, as many people visit the gardens every day as we would normally. And so we're selling out on the weekends and we did sell out last Friday as well. So some weekdays as well. So we ask you to make your reservations well in advance if you wanna visit on the weekends. Um, but one wonderful way to visit is as a member of Filoli. Uh, we have member morning hours from 9 a.m. to 10 a.m. on the weekends through May. And that's a great time to be able to get in and see the beautiful gardens before lots of other folks um, are, are admitted. So encourage you to become a member and get a special treat of visiting the gardens in the morning. And with that, I'd like to introduce, uh, let me stop sharing here, Stephanie Linder and Kara Newport in conversation. Thank you so much. Thanks, Susan. Um, and I just want to start by a little with a little bit of background for those of you who are joining for the first time. Um, we, we thought of this series as part of Women's History Month. And um, when I think of women's history, I think of, of those that preceded uh, me and Stephanie and our leadership roles and the influence that they had. And it wasn't so long ago, you know, it's, it's a pretty near past. So I thought it would be really important to talk about current women leaders, talk with current women leaders and how um, they are influencing our future. And, um, and so that was the, the group of people that we invited to participate in this. And Stephanie, um, what I'd love to do is just start by telling everyone your story. What has your journey been to uh, leadership at a public garden? Well, thank you, Kara, and thanks, Susan. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here with you today. Um, so my path to, to public gardens uh, is really through conservation. Um, so I, after many years in uh, women's organizations, actually, uh, Planned Parenthood, uh, domestic violence prevention, I uh, used to teach U.S. women's history. Um, after all of that, um, I pivoted towards uh, public lands, and I worked at the Trust for Public Land, uh, the Sierra Club, and I was really active in land conservation, park space. Uh, and that's actually my path to gardens. So I was down at the Santa Barbara Botanic Garden for a couple of years prior to coming here to San Francisco Botanical Garden. 
And that is a conservation garden. It's an incredible place. If you haven't been to Santa Barbara Botanic Garden, I highly recommend it. Um, the setting is stunning in Mission Canyon. And the, the mission is to conserve California's extraordinary biodiversity with an emphasis on the Channel Islands and the Central Coast, which is sort of a hotbed of biodiversity within a hotbed of biodiversity that California is. And so that was sort of my path or the connector was, uh, you know, I think there's a fair amount of plant blindness even amongst environmentalists or parks and open space or land trusts, conservationists, uh, because plant blindness is such a, a huge problem that even people who are saving land sometimes don't even understand the incredible role that plants play in habitat. I mean, plants are habitat. And so that was sort of the, the hook that got me into gardens was plant conservation and how that relates to, um, you know, pr protecting the planet. So we've had a question and I, I wanna just go back to it. Say a little bit more about plant blindness. I think you and I, Kind of, are, you know, instinctively know what that means, but, but tell our audience a little bit more about, you know, the dif difference between being plant blind and plant aware, and how can we all become more plant aware? Well, even just a generation ago, you know, many people could name, and maybe they didn't know the scientific name or the Latin name, but they could name lots of different plants. They could identify lots of different tree or plant species just you know, from a leaf. Um, they knew how to grow things and cultivate things in their backyard. It was passed down through generations and lots of different cultures. But over the past generation or two, and maybe more, uh, that connection to plants has really diminished. And most people can identify many corporate logo, logos, but maybe like 10 different plants. And, um, you know, and it's sort of all, it's all just green. It's this green stuff, right? But there isn't, um, when people aren't taught the names and the origins and the roles and the importance of these plants and because of the loss of biodiversity and in a lot of the places that people go, they don't see the same range of, of plants. They're just not as familiar with them. And it's just not part of general, like sort of common culture anymore. And this is really why one of the many reasons botanical gardens exist today. And it's a main driver of botanical gardens is to, um, help people become more plant aware um, for a whole variety of reasons, including protecting them, but also understanding that all, all life on the planet depends on plants. These are, it, it is not a nice to have, it is a must have. So, so I, I think that, um, you know, that, that actually you're inspiring a lot of questions and a lot of comments. I think that, you know, when there's a lot of discussion in our industry and in public gardens about plant blindness and also, um, you know, the, the related problems, nature deficit disorder, which Richard Liu really popularized a few years ago. And, um, and then also um, the, the disconnect between plants and food production and people not knowing where their food comes from. So, you know, there's, this is a lot of um, the role, I think, of public gardens right now. Um, and I think that we all play it in a different way. If I will leave, um, we talk a lot about food production. That's what an estate was for. And, um, and, you know, one of the things I love about public gardens is that, you know, we, we encourage all audiences to love all public gardens. And you just promoted Santa Barbara Botanical Garden. And, you know, we are right here next door to each other, but we have very different goals and missions. So let's talk a little bit about um, your, um, your role as a public, public garden, I, as you like to say, mm -hmm. in the city of San Francisco and, um, and what your mission is and what you're offering to the community. So our, our mission is that we connect plant, people to plants, the planet, and each other. And so gardens are a venue, um, and gardens are a space, a gathering place, and gardens are a place where people form friendships. Um, and, and so that's, that connection to each other is actually a really important part of the mission as well. But it's about plants, it's about people, and a sense of place, really. And we are in the heart of San Francisco, in the heart of Golden Gate Park. Uh, we, pre-COVID, we're seeing more than 400,000 visitors a year. So we serve a lot of people. Uh, 
San Francisco residents come for free. And um, we, again, pre-COVID, we were serving about 13,000 school children through our school-based programs. And that was mostly um, with San Francisco Unified School District. So very much a, a public community resource uh, but like many public community resources, uh, philanthropy is critical and membership is critical. And, we, you know, I head up the, the nonprofit partner in this relationship. And, uh, our, you know, our goals really are to um, cure plant blindness, um, nature deficit disorder, all the things that we're talking about, and to pr protect biodiversity. So one of the big uh, projects that we're working on right now is we're in the final stretch of a capital campaign to new, build a new plant nursery, uh, which will really elevate our ability to work on global plant conservation in partnership with lots of other gardens across the country and across the globe. Uh, we partner with Botanical Gardens Conservation International. And in fact, their executive director, another great woman leader in uh, the field, uh, Abby Meyer will be our keynote speaker uh, at our virtual annual event, which is May 19th at 5.30. Uh, and we'll be talking about the role that a global conservation um, effort through, through botanical gardens. You know, I think a lot of visitors don't necessarily understand that these are more than pretty places. Uh, that we we do have this conservation mission and and our our new nursery is going to help us really expand that part of our work. And um, th that's great. And I think and Abby's wonderful. So I'm so glad she's going to be in the area um, for that. That'll be really fun to see her. Uh, I, I think that public gardens um, play a, a role as a connector. Um, that's the way that I feel about it. And I think you're right. We're all more than pretty places. We all have deep stories to tell. And even a place uh, like Thailoli, which has a very pretty front, um, you know, we, we have a lot of um, preservation that we're doing as well and plant conservation and um, in, in different missions. But, but I think the connection part is really about how do we um, bring the pe people in and, and how do we make sure that we're um, attracting uh, diverse audiences and connecting to different audiences? And I think you're really uniquely positioned to do that exceptionally well. So share, share with our audience um, what it's like to be a public public garden. Yeah, so we, um, you know, we're quite accessible. Uh, as I said, we are um, free to San Francisco residents. We are also, we joined um, this summer um, because I think really what finally, um, you know, made this happen was the catalyst to make this happen this summer um, between the, the pandemic, um, the movements for social justice, the um, economic hardship that so many people were facing. We uh, did something that we had been talking about doing for a long time and we made it happen. We joined the Museums for All program. And we did that in um, collaboration with the Japanese Tea Garden and the Conservatory of Flowers, which are also located in um, Golden Gate Park. And we were really pleased to have the mayor issue um, the press release. So it was, we got the word out in a big way that um, no one's gonna be denied access here for lack of funds. And so families of four can come to all three of those institutions um, for free if they qualify for SNAP benefits or the, the, the same thing, the California state benefits that, that are similar to that. So we, um, we did that and at the same time, we launched a major advertising campaign uh, called Everybody's Garden to uh, in, the, in the wake of George, George Floyd's killing in the wake of the, the, the quote, burning while black incident with Chris Cooper in, in um, Central Park. We just wanted to make, make it very plain that everyone is truly welcome here and that we will do everything we can. And we always have more work to do and more to learn, but that we wanna be a place where everyone does truly feel welcome and can come and enjoy the space. So the Everybody's Garden campaign was on, um, in a lot of public places, there's digital elements, but it was bus shelters, billboards, um, and just really getting the word out. One, we're, we're open. We were closed for 11 weeks during COVID, but we reopened June, June 1st. So we wanted to make sure everyone knew we were open 
and we were open to everyone. Uh, and it also was part of the 150th uh, anniversary celebration of Golden Gate Park. And one of the taglines for that celebration was everybody's park. And the Rec and Park Department, who we partner with, uh, has a strong commitment to equity. And really, they wanted that to be a, a message, a part of the celebration. So we kind of glommed onto that and um, said yes, and at the garden too. Um, so that's been really exciting. Uh, the campaign seems to have worked in the sense that we had record breaking visitation. We had our busiest uh, January and February on record. Um, you know, beautiful magnolia blooms help too. And um, so, um, but it's really just the start. We have established a, um, a justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion uh, subcommittee on our strategic planning uh, in our strategic planning work, and we're doing taking all kinds of other initiatives. We have surveyed staff and board to get through some baseline data. We have um, we're doing more and more languages, having um, our our maps and our seasonal maps available in multiple languages and. And there's lot, lots more to do, but we have def during this COVID period, we definitely um, increased our activity on this. We had already initiated some implicit bias uh, workshops for staff and board, uh, and we're looking at future training. And and I that's that's really wonderful. And I think you, as I said, you're you're really have been ahead of the curve because you you had a diverse audience. And I think that. Um, one of the uh, actually many um, positive outcomes of uh, of both the pandemic and of the racial justice issues um, of the last year has been that I think public gardens have become a safer space um, for people to come to. And I think, you know, um, just to kind of compare and contrast a little bit, by Loli, uh, we experienced the same thing. Um, we released our board approved um, a DEAI diversity, equity, accessibility, and inclusion policy statement. Um, we have a task force that's composed of staff, um, staff, board members and community representatives. And, um, and what we have learned in the last couple of years is that our audience is very reflective of the regional audience, which means that we have a lot of diversity. We're a very diverse region. So, um, so we have a lot of diversity. Um, we also participate in the Museums for All program, um, which I think is a very important um, program and also partnership with the library so that you can check out passes um, to come to come to Filoli. So I think providing that access right now is really important. We actually have some more questions that popped up about plant blindness and I sort of want to you know, kind of combine them together. I, I think there's there's some comments going on in the um, in the Q and A about um, about how. Uh, maybe that plant blindness has a, a negative connotation against people who don't have access to plants or access to growing plants. Um, but I actually think to me, that's the point. And that's the point of public gardens is that we can provide the, that access. Um, and then I also just wanna, um, I, I have a question in here for you, Stephanie, but I also wanna take this opportunity to answer another question, which is that um, providing that access and that access to plants isn't always about providing the Latin name. So the, the question has been like, can we get more plant labels? And you know, when is finally gonna do a, a better job of labeling? Well, that's actually, we're, we're a historic landscape. And so labels are part of a historic landscape and we have a preservation goal of preserving the visual of the historic landscape. So the plant education comes in different paths um, for us, and um, and there there are, you know there are tours, there are different ways. Um, but I think a lot of this requires the people connection as well. And and so as people are living in smaller footprints and having less access to nature and and less access to specific information about plants. Kind of programming are you doing um, to reach out? Like, you know, how, how are you making those connections? Well, like many uh, cultural institutions, you know, we launched an at-home page on our website, and you can actually go and see. Most of the programs have been recorded and are available now. Um, but we've had a number of educational programming uh, opportunities. Most recently. 
Uh, we had Dr. Emily Coffey from uh, another great women woman leader in, in the botanical garden world. And she uh, did a presentation on magnolia conservation. And so we that's just one example, but we have programs like that. And we've had those programs live and in person uh, historically, but with COVID, you know, we've switched to the, um, at, you know, at home virtual model. So we have provided that kind of programming. I will also say that we have had um, an incredible response to our current uh, docent training that just launched. We do our doc docent training a couple times a year and our um, director of learning and engagement, um, uh, or sorry, our director of volunteer engagement, Chloe uh, Weiland, who's just uh, amazing. She quickly pivoted to a virtual format. And, you know, we have the largest docent class in our history right now. So um, our docents um, are our most effective interpretive tool out in the garden. Um, we, you know, have submitted a major grant proposal, fingers crossed, to do an um, interpretive uh, master plan. Uh, but, you know, really it's that person to person um, uh, you know, exchange that I think is really um, useful. The other thing we did this year uh, with our Magnolia season is we piloted uh, special uh, identification, you know, tags that have uh, QR codes. So you could, you can hold your phone up to it and then you'll pull up our database. Um, uh, Garden Explorer is the way the public can interface with our Iris BG database information basically. And can learn all about that magnolia. So you'll learn its common name, its Latin name, um, the region of the world that it's native to. There's a whole series of photographs. So, um, th you know, th things like that to just bring in um, a little bit more depth of interpretation to uh, certain collections. And, um, you know, and I think our Garden Explorer tool online, again, a great resource during, during COVID is um, you can, um, just find a wealth of information there. That's great. And my, my team came to see that and we're very excited to have, you know, if you're a plant person, having that additional information is really great. Another tool that we've been using at Filoli is PlantSnap um, because uh, there was a partnership with the American Public Gardens Association. And if a garden's participating in PlantSnap, its effectiveness goes up because they know, you know, where you kind of feed it information. Um, so you train it so that it's about 95% effective on our property, which is which is a great tool in case um, people don't have access to the database and just want a quick, you know, what's what's that plant? And that's another way just to encourage people on in everyday life is to be curious, right? Like learn about that plant. And is it native? Is it non-native? And importantly, does it need water, you know, and, um, and, and does it grow here? And will the gophers eat it? And, uh, you know, all those really important questions. Um, so I, uh, I want to segue a little bit, um, thinking of water and thinking of where we live and thinking of environmental conservation. Um, I think that um, you have a background in working with women in political leadership positions, and um, and you know I know you and I have had other conversations where uh, there's a real strong connection between women leaders and uh, you know bigger overarching conservation efforts. So kind of tie all that back in together. What how do you you know what, what do you see those connections? Um. Well, you know, I do think there's been, you know, there's been research on what happens when you start to approach parity in terms of women's leadership. I mean, we're far from there, but even when you get, you know, sort of 30% of a legislature female, you see a change in the policies that come out of that legislature. Um, when you, um, you know, there, uh, Rachel's network, which is a group of environmental women, they did some research. Uh, and even when you sort of remove party from the equation, uh, women legislatures have score higher on environmental issues and on environmental issues. If you look at the various, you know, advocacy organizations that rate uh, the voting records of elected officials, um, overall, you see more uh, environmentally friendly policies coming out of um, from, from women legislators. So there's a, a lot of evidence to show that it makes a difference. Um, 
And I think having representation of women and of people of color at, you know, all the decision making tables you know, has, you know, has a significant impact. And I think the big, the biggest change that I'm seeing actually in the conservation world right now is that, uh, that finally the issue of envir environmental justice and the intersection of uh, racial justice and environmental sustainability is, you know, I feel like that's kind of risen up out of, um, there's been people talking about this for years, but I finally feel like it's getting the attention that it deserves. And I think the biggest example of this is our new Secretary of the Interior. Um, and for the first time in this country's history, we, you know, we have a Native American women woman running the Department of Interior. And if that doesn't give people hope, I don't, I, you know, I don't know it will. But that that gives me a lot of hope. Yeah. Yeah, I think so too. And, and, and I think even, I mean, you see it big and little, right? You know, even as we look at our own industry, we see that change in leadership and we see um, a bit of a change in focus and uh, in some of the, the gardens and, you know, kind of away from development and back toward authenticity and representation. Um, so, um, but to talk a little bit more about the organization that you're specifically involved in. I know that you personally help women get into these positions. So to tell, tell us about that. Yeah, so I am a, a graduate of the Emerge Training Program, uh, which is a candidate training program for Democratic women. And uh, I graduated from the program in 2005. And then um, uh, several years later, I uh, became, I joined the board and then I was uh, board chair at a really um, pivotal Pivotal time for uh, Emerge California, the state organization. So Emerge was was founded here in um, the the Bay Area um, by um, a, a few women around the kitchen table who um, were actually very inspired by Kamala Harris and her early uh, efforts to run for office here in San Francisco. Uh, Andrea Justeel, among other women leaders, got together to. Um, form this organization and it's grown into a huge national organization. I believe it's in 27 states right now. Um, the, the mayor of San, of San Francisco, London Breed is a graduate of the program. The mayor of Oakland, Lynn Staff is a graduate of the program. And our new secretary of interior is actually a graduate of the program in New Mexico. And there's many, many other, in fact, it's a good problem to have that there's too many to name because I think we're finally sort of hitting this tipping point where where, um, you know, we're starting to really see this, this change and have more women um, in elected roles. So, so I uh, um, was board chair at a time when we really became a statewide organization. We had started in the Bay Area and then went to Northern California and then we did a lot of outreach to Southern California and sort of coincided with my time of splitting my time between the Bay Area and um, Ojai, where I was um, living part-time while I was working at um, the Santa Barbara Botanic Garden. So it was a great um, way to get to know all these fantastic women across the state who were involved in uh, in politics for all the right reasons, in my opinion. And um, yeah, so it's been uh, a great um, opportunity to just understand uh, you know, what the barriers are for women and how this training and this network and the alumni network um, can really help alleviate some of the, the barriers and obstacles that women face in running for office. And the, the biggest one, it, I really think, is thinking that they're qualified enough. Um, there's a lot, you know, there a lot of times, you know, someone will say, well, you should really run or you should, you know, you should go for this opportunity. And they think, oh, I, I need more experience. I need more training. I need more time. Um, that tends to be um, a gendered response, actually, that <laughs> uh, is, you know, not helpful. So there's a, a lot of like, go for it. We'll give you the training. We'll give you the resources and uh, the support network. Um, but it's really about understanding that in a democracy, you know, all these voices have to be at the table. And if and if they're not, um, the policies that come out on the other end are just not going to be uh, as inclusive or, um, you know, 
there, there's just a perspective missing. And so, um, yeah, it's, it was, it's been a great experience and some of my nearest and dearest friends, um, you know, have, have come through that program. So anyway, if you know anyone who should run for office, um, direct them to, to Emerge. And tell, and tell us again, it's Emerge? Emerge, uh, it's a national organization here mm -hmm. in California. It's Emerge California. And uh, I, like I said, I believe it's 27 states right now. So, um, but yeah, it's all, all online and it's a, it's a fabulous program. And it's really very satisfying to, um, you know, look around the city and the state now and now the country and see so many of our alumni uh, in really um, important leadership roles. And, and I know this is specifically um, for, for Democratic women, but I think that there's there's evidence that um, just any woman, you know, yes. is, is, it changes the policy basis. Um, so it's, it, and, you know, we, I think, I you know, I think what I just heard you say and what I think is very important to me is that women support women, you mm -hmm. know, it, it, whether, whether we are on the same, you know, political spectrum or not, it doesn't really matter. We want to see that parity in elected office and in leadership positions. And I think that's, that's just our overall goal. When I um, actually moved to California a few years ago, I participated in a, a women's leadership forum at, in Berkeley and um, the McKinsey study at, that was released that year, I think it was 2018, was talking about women in the C-suite and that it would take at, this, at the current rate to um, achieve a parity of women in the C-suite of um, major, of organizations, of, of any organization, would take a hundred years at the current pace. So we've got a lot of work ahead of us. I think that that's one of the challenges we face as a woman. If, if there's one woman at the table, you know, everyone claps and says, oh, that's great progress. Um, and, and it is, but, you know, really we want more women at the table. And, um, and I think that that's, you know, sounds like your personal mission and goal and what you've been supporting. And I think that there's always more that we can do as women to support other women in these roles. And I think that's really critical. Um, turning that attention to the environment a little bit, let's imagine a world where, you know, we have uh, this political uh, power in, um, in environmental policy. What, what do you think that the, the greatest um, uh, opportunity for environmental policy is that would change our, um, our world and have, you know, and have an impact? There's little things we can do at Public Gardens. It's really about policy um, that we're gonna make a, make a change. What do you think that would be? What's your perception on that? Well, I mean, I think climate change is, you know, front, front and center and, um, our dependence on fossil fuel, uh, you know, I mean, I just, it, it's, I, I do think though that there are gardens doing amazing work on this. And uh, I would say maybe unexpected and sort of outsized <laughs> um, work on this, which is pretty uh, incredible. Um, I mean, the, the Phipps Conservatory in Pittsburgh is a leading voice on clean energy, clean buildings. And they're like at like, you know, six, six level, like they've got, they're well beyond lead, you know, they're into regenerative thinking and living buildings. And, and so I, I do think there, there are gardens that are stepping up in major ways. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, one of the um, most devastating effects of climate change is our loss of biodiversity and the extinction crisis. Uh, and I think about um, a former colleague, amazing woman leader in this field, Dr. Denise Knapp at the Santa Barbara Botanic Garden, uh, who's been you know, very um, involved and influential in you know, statewide discussions about protecting biodiversity in the face of climate change. Uh, and I think for gardens, understanding that um, you know, th th that's our sort of central role, but then just how we operate um, and, you know, do we have electric fleets? Our, our new nursery that I spoke of early that we're going to be building, it's got to be, we're getting off of gas. It's going to be all electric. It'll eventually be all clean powered. And, um, you know, there are things we can do to demonstrate uh, to our visitors, to our staff, um, the kinds of actions that institutions can take. Um, both in terms of our plant-based mission, but just in terms of our general operation. Um, but yeah, I, you know, I'm with Greta. 
you know, if you're not talking about climate change and getting off of fossil fuels, I don't, I mean, you know, I, I, there are so many pressing issues and um, parks and open space are what has been near and dear to me, but these, these, these don't exist in isolation from that. I mean, I um, have now, you know, witnessed um, personally and have had many friends and colleagues devastated by uh, the unprecedented fires that have hit California over the past several years. And, you know, I think that's when this really became um, a very uh, visceral ish and personal to me. Um, and I think for too many people still climate change is an abstract kind of issue and it's, it's, it's in the future, it's not here, but um, you know, but drought and uh, catastrophic fire is, um, it's, it's right here, it's right now. And, you know, I think the last few years have brought that, brought that home. I'm, I'm hoping that the, the, the plus side of that or the silver lining of that is that we're going to see more action. I mean, I think uh, the, some of the governor's recent, um, you know, announcements about 30 by 30 and and the the, con the statewide conservation efforts are really encouraging. And again, uh, excited about um, you know our new Secretary of the Interior and what we might see coming out of that that department now. Um, yeah, and I, I want to give up another plug, another garden that's doing such great things as Bernheim Arboretum, who is a giant arboretum and they're carbon neutral. And that's, you know, been their mission from the beginning. And I think, um, I think there's a real uh, effort, as you say, to get off the fossil fuels. We actually have a couple of questions about electricity. Um, how, how is that better? And, um, and, you know, I think both Stephanie and I could probably talk about this for a while, but I think that that's where you have the opportunity for clean energy is through electric. And there's been, you know, many years of people not understanding um, that is a positive source. I also um, want to give a plug for Peninsula Clean Energy, for those of you who are on the peninsula, um, by shifting to Peninsula Clean Energy, which Filoli has done, um, it's 100% clean energy. And, and so even though we're not producing that clean energy at Filoli, we're using clean energy that's produced. And the more that we can support clean energy, either as a homeowner at, or as an institution, um, the more that, that um, those industries are going to shift in that direction. The more the higher supply and demand, the higher the demand, um, the more the supply will shift. And, and so I think that, you know, we, we all talk often about moving to elect, electric, electricity because um, it can be produced with clean energy. And that's, you know, another question has popped up. Some electricity is produced with fossil fuels, but not all of it. And, and again, there are ways in these days that you can choose to only use clean energy. And I think that that's the direction we're all moving in. Did you want to add any more to that, Stephanie? Yeah, I signed up here in San Francisco for clean power, you can do it. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Um, so sh shifting a, a little bit, you know, one of the, one of the things that the um, pandemic did kind of back to, you know, plant awareness and, um, and, and home gardening and living off the grid and you know some of these concepts, there has been a huge emergence of gardening. Now gardening is, is historically one of the top hobbies. It's, it's, it's always been you know, in the top three, top five hobbies in America and, and in the world really. But um, what have you seen about this, you know, re, this new interest, this emerging interest in, in gardening and um, and, and do you think it's here to stay? Is this a pandemic moment? Or do you think that we have, you know, people digging in literally um, going forward here? I think once you catch the bug for gardening, you don't really lose it. Um, so I, I think it's here to stay. I mean, what was really tough for us is that our final spring plant sale before we were gonna decommission our nursery in preparation to build our, our new nursery, we had to cancel it because of COVID. We, we ended up having a kind of a clearance sale, but we didn't get to do our big uh, spring blowout sale. Uh, we do have plants for sale. Uh, right now it's uh, Fridays through Mondays at our Arbor and we definitely um, see a lot of interest there and people are still coming to, to purchase plants for their, their homes. Um, 
you know, our new nursery, in addition to uh, helping us propagate plants for the collections and for conservation, um, you know, we've had about 80 volunteers who, um, who worked regular shifts in our nursery uh, to propagate plants also for sale. And uh, when we reopen that nursery and we relaunch our, our big sales, uh, we're going to be really focusing on, um, you know, taking a piece of this garden home with you and uh, propagating plants from, you know, our, our collections that um, you might not be able to find everywhere. So, you know, I think uh, that keeps it interesting for people and for the, the, the diehards, you know, they, they really like to find something a little unusual, um, you know, but we, we also have a lot of volunteers who work on our green teams. So in San Francisco, a lot of people don't have home gardens. Uh, they might have a little patch of sand in the backyard. They might have a balcony, um, but they come here to garden here. And so we have been um, incredibly successful um, with our um, horticultural, we call them green teams. I just saw a bunch of them out there. I just wanna give a shout out to them. They were doing a fabulous job in New Zealand today, replanting a whole area there with some really cool grasses. And it's just, it's beautiful. And it, to, to see, um, you know, people gardening um, here alongside um, our horticulturalists uh, is really fabulous. So, and it extends our, our a uh, small but mighty team of horticulturalists to have these teams of volunteers come work with them. And they get to learn a lot too because the horticulturalists will uh, sort of set the scene like th th this is what we're, these are the weeds that we're pulling today or here's the plants that we're planting today. This is, you know, they get a little, a little instruction um, and then they have the camaraderie and the experience of working together. So in, in the city, we might, you know, we might be their garden. <laughs> so yeah absolutely and I I love that idea of taking a little bit of the garden home with you I think that we try to do that at I want to go through plant sales but then also our production our jams and jellies and honeys and vinegars and mm -hmm. that sort of thing so um but one one thing that I'd love to see that's just been so much fun is the um, re-emergence of plant swaps you know, I think that having previously been in a garden in the Southeast, this is a, you know, pass along plants is a really common thought there. And, and in fact, I used to run, I called it the exchange on my porch where I had chickens. So I would leave eggs and people would drop things off on my front porch. And it was also all, often cuttings, you know, or um, iris rhizomes or, you know, something fun like that. So the sharing of plants, I think is really important. And you'd mentioned the small space. I think house plants is, is a really easy way to do that because they, they propagate so easily. And we're actually hosting a plant swap here at Filoli, a house plant swap here at Filoli in the, in the next couple months. So, um, so they're really great. Um, and there, and someone mentioned there's some online communities, um, for that as well, um, coming up. So, um, and I think you, you, you all have participated in similar things as well, right? With partners, um, doing exchanges and things like that. Yeah. I mean, the, um, I, th I think that the, um, Great thing again, I think you mentioned it earlier, is that is botanical gardens working to get together. So um, and sharing plant material and having backup um, collections. I mean, I think that's where we're really going in terms of in terms of that is sort of these um, institutional partnerships. Mm -hmm. And again, through B BGCI Botanical Garden Conservation International, we have a magnolia grafting project, and we're working in partnership with Atlanta and JC Ralston. And um, you know, I sort of and UC Berkeley. You know, I I think. Um, you know, we we're swapping at that kind of level too, right? So it's it's um, it's important to um, you know not um, you don't want to be the the garden that has the last of anything, right? You <laughs> uh, that's not a good, a good thing. So making sure that they that there are these um, backup collections. Um, and, and, and that visitors um, and researchers can, you know, use and see and experience these plants in other parts of the country and the world. Yeah, and I think, I think that's a really good point. And one of my, my favorite parts about public garden is that even if you have a seed bank or if you have a floral legion um, or if you have these other kinds of 
um, preserved plants um, in some fashion that aren't available all the time, almost always you have an example of that plant on your property. And, and that's the, the public access out of public garden is just so clear. Um, it's, it's not like we have our best stuff in storage. It's all out there for everyone to see. Our collection is truly accessible um, to the public. So we're, we're kind of heading into the end. Is there anything that you wanted to, that, that I haven't asked you that you wanted to talk about, Stephanie? And then I have, I have a big question for the end. Okay. Um, well, I actually do um, want to just, you know, we're at the year anniversary of, um, we, you know, we closed for 11 weeks uh, a year ago tomorrow. <laughs> uh, to, I, re I remember our um, leadership team uh, watching the mayor's uh, press conference uh, this day a year ago where we learned that we were going into the shelter in place or orders. And I guess I, I just want to say that I'm really glad that I still have the same um, group of people here doing ama amazing work and, and shout out to a couple of women who in particular on that, that team. So uh, Jessa Barzilay, who's our director of learning engagement and Annette Huddle, who's our uh, director of youth education. Um, they've uh, managed to pull off the impossible uh, here. And we are serving you know, thousands of children, uh, mostly for free through our Bean Sprouts Family Days programs out in our children's garden. And then we also ran our second year of summer camp and launched our after school program, a brand new program. Um, these programs are, you know, selling out now in 24 hours. Um, the um, parents have been, this has been a really, really hard year on families um, and kids. And, um, you know, I, I don't know that, um, I, I guess I, I think that people don't realize that the really truly essential role that gardens play. I mean, we were able to reopen June 1st and we uh, were deemed essential and our horticulturalists were deemed essential. And, you know, that's fabulous. Um, but I think there's been this, um, I don't know, I, it, it's hard to put words into it. It's just when you see children who came to, came to the garden for these programs, whose parents said they literally hadn't been um, out of the house, away from a screen, or with other children for weeks on end when they, you know, came to these programs. Um, it's, a, it's a really, really vital resource. And, you know, I have two um, women here, and I should also give a shout out to Jen Topler, who's been running the, um, the after school program and camp as well. Um, these these three women have really created um, a place for kids and family when, where when there was really no place else to go, mm -hmm. uh, and you know I just there are these um, amazing stories. There are a lot of heroes um, through COVID, and and I would put these these ladies in that category. That's great. That's a great addition and. And, and I think it is great that you were able to run that and great that gardens were able to be open as those places of, of respite. I mean, I think gardens are one of the heroes of COVID, you know, just, just because people needed that place to go and, and connect and ground and, um, and, and think about something else, you know, and, and think about the future and positive. And there's something about, um, you know, every time you plant a seed, you're planting hope for the future. You, you, it's, it's not for that moment, it's for the next moment, it's for the future moment. So um, that's really great that you've been able to provide that for the community. Um, okay, so um, this might be my final question. It's a really tough one. Um, I always like to pick you know, a good question from either the audience or somewhere else uh, for this big final question, but this is it. So what is your favorite plant? Oh, wow. Well, <laughs> um, <laughs> So I, I'm a, a California native in, enthusiast, um, and it is really it is really hard to 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 pick one. Um, you know what? I might just talk about what's right behind me. Um, this is a California buckeye uh, in spring, and um, it's 
in the heart of our uh, California Native section, uh, the Arthur Menzi uh, Garden of California Natives here at the garden. Um, yeah, I, I, again, just coming full circle to where we started this conversation, you know, coming, coming to the garden world through conservation uh, really meant the path was, was Natives um, for me. And um, I love that we have a global collection. I love that we're involved in global conservation efforts. Uh, and, but I'm really happy that part of it is our California Native section and our Redwoods, which is also, you know, our iconic megaflora um, that, um, you know, resonates with so many people when they come to visit California. And one of the first things they want to see is, uh, is a Redwood tree. So we, we have a, an abundance of them here at the, at the garden, but I, I would have to today. Today, I'll just pick. I'll just pick the buckeye that's um, behind me. That's a, that's a that's a a good a good solid choice there. And um, and I do want to give one more plug for the great things that you're doing. I, I think that you know the the balance of if you can't uh, if you can't always grow natives, um, uh, and and you can always grow natives. That's always possible. But if, if for our, you know, whatever reason you want to grow non-natives, I think your garden and, um, and mine too are looking at those ways to grow non-natives that are uh, resource sensitive. And I think that's really, um, that I really want to applaud you for that. I think that was part of the replanting that's happening today, probably, right? The plants that perform better in, in your area. Yeah, we are really sort of, um, sort of refining our collections and this will be a years long process. I mean, this garden has been here 80, 80 years and over the next you know, decades, they'll, there will be an evolution of the collection. And um, because of our mild foggy climate here, we um, have the ability to grow quite a range. And so we're really looking at the climactic regions of the world uh, like cloud forest regions. Um, we're looking at um, developing a new Afromontane collection um, near our, in between our children's garden and our new nursery. Uh, we're also, you know, just really trying to focus on the, the plants of the world that would thrive in this kind of um, very mild, cool, foggy climate. Um, it's, it's really an asset. Um, to, to this garden and it's a distinguishing feature of this garden. So, um, you know, and, you know, when I moved to the name, to this neighborhood, I live right in the neighborhood, um, you know, had a backyard of sand in the fog and I thought, well, what, what am I going to grow here? And uh, originally being from, from the Hudson Valley is very different uh, climate. And I came to the botanical garden to get advice and to get plants and to see what was growing here. And um, that's what inspired, inspired me to garden in my, in, my, in my backyard was what we had here. And it was mostly, mostly native, not 100%, but mostly native. That's great. That's great. Well, thank you so much, Stephanie. I'm going to turn it back over to Susan to wrap us up here. And um, and please, everybody, visit visit gardens, visit um, visit San Francisco Botanical Garden when you can, and of course, always come to Filoli too. But I, that's one of the things I love about having my garden partners out there. Stephanie and I have, have become um, quite good friends because we we can compare notes, but we also contrast. You know, we're just such different different gardens. And so we can we can really round out the um, what's available in our region. And I think that's what's really important. So thank you very much for being here. Thank you. It was a pleasure. And I want to say thank you too. And I'm so happy you said the California buckeye because it's when I'm also a California native plant enthusiast and planted a buckeye in our front yard when we got rid of our lawn and replaced it all with native plants. And uh, it's so hopeful out there right now to see it's just starting to sound out its little blooms. Um, and, you know, I think that 2020, 2020 was, um, was such a difficult year for all of us. And this spring of 2021 is, is giving us some hope and, um, and, and gardens uh, as a place to visit are definitely a way for us to, to feel hopeful. So we're so grateful the San Francisco Botanical Garden is there for the community and that you all are sharing such great, wonderful stuff. And I wanna just make sure everyone knows to visit your at home page um, the at home at sfbg.org. They have a lot of great educational information there and just wonderful ways to, to visit virtually. 
Um, and, and Stephanie's got a background scene there that you can download um, if you want for your own Zoom meetings. And we're, we have them on our Philoli page too. So there's lots of virtual content available to you from Philoli as well. We're doing YouTube videos and, um, and there's all kinds of great, the, including this talk. So um, this talk will be on our YouTube page probably by next week soon. So if you'd like to watch it again or share it with friends, um, we encourage you to do so. All of the, um, all of the, the Women's Speaker Series talks are on our YouTube page or will be soon. So please check them out in case you missed any. And uh, thank you all so much for being here, Stephanie and Kara. This was fascinating. I do have one more question for Kara because we didn't get to hear. What's your favorite plant? Oh, tricky. Ha <laughs> ha. <laughs> 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 well, I've only been in California for four years, so I'm learning the natives, and um, and I have a new a new fascination and love for the manzanita these days. Um, they they remind me a little bit of my my southern, you know crepe myrtle roots, but, you know, in an, in a native plant, you have the beautiful bark and the curly forms. And, um, I think that they're underutilized in the landscape is, is what I have decided. So it's a lot, a lot, a lot you can do with it. Wonderful. Great. Well, thank you both so much for your time. This was really interesting and thank you all for joining us and hopefully we see you all next week. Have a great day. Great. Thanks. Bye.